Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of Psalms, Psalm 68, resuming our study today in verse 22. Psalm 68, verse 22. We'll begin in just a minute. I hope you can get your Bible, open it up to the book of Psalms. And uh, while you're doing that, Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And that's a place where you can study the Bible at your pace, at your convenience, as much as you want, anytime you want, just by using my audio Bible messages, three complete series going through the Bible at thebibleversebyverse.com. It's as simple as clicking on the book you want to study, clicking on the chapter, and listening. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Well, let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 68, verse 22. The Lord said, I will bring again from Bashan. I will bring my people again from the depths of the sea. God's enemies can try to run from him, but no matter where they hide, no matter where they go, the Lord will find them, and he will bring them to the place of judgment, and that is what this is talking about. You cannot outrun God. You cannot outrun the judgment of God. You are not anywhere near big enough or strong enough or fast enough to do that. It's over. Is finished. You're dead. You're lost. It's a lost cause. If you don't repent of your sin and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and ask for forgiveness and mercy through him and ask him to take over your life, God's judgment and his wrath is going to catch up to you and you can't do anything to stop it. And you're kidding yourself if you think you can. You're going to die and you're going to wake up in hell. You're going to wake up in the lake of fire. And when you do, you're going to realize that there's no getting out. And you're there forever. People don't like to think about that. People make up all sorts of excuses to explain those verses away. But Jesus said, God said in his word, it's a place of eternal torment. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever and ever nonstop. And where there's smoke, there's burning. And so they have to be burning. They have to be suffering. It is eternal torment, eternal punishment. And so he's coming, and he's coming in judgment. Verse 23, That thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies, and the tongue of thy dogs in the same. God will get holy revenge. God will get holy justice on behalf of his people. I've said it before, that's not your business. That's not my business. If we're Christians and we're mistreated by people, it's not our business to get them back. That's God's job. Don't try to do God's work for him. That work. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And he'll do it a whole lot better than you and I ever could. And so he will do it. It will be what the enemies of God and the enemies of righteousness and the enemies of his word and the enemies of Christians deserve. It'll be final. It'll be horrifying. Not just because they sinned, but because, as we saw a few broadcasts ago, they wouldn't change. That's really the thing that seals their doom. The big sin that sends a person to hell is not the sin of lying, as terrible as it is. It's not the sin of homosexuality, as terrible as it is. It's not even the sin of murder, as terrible as it is. The sin that'll send a person to hell is the sin of not changing, of not repenting, of not finding mercy through Jesus Christ, of rejecting Christ. That is the sin that sends people to hell ultimately. They reject the Savior. 
And so, God will bring their end on earth to a horrifying conclusion, and their end will never end. They'll be conscious. They'll be aware. They'll feel every ounce of pain that hell can dish out for all of eternity because they not only sinned, but they rejected God. You think you can improve on that? You think that you should get revenge on people who hurt you or disregard God or his word? Why? You think you can do better than God? He will show mercy to anyone who wants it. He will wait until his mercy has run out for that particular person, and then he will punish if they don't take advantage of it. Leave it in God's hands. You pray for the people who hurt you. Verse 24. They have seen thy goings, O God, even the goings of my God, my King, in the sanctuary. God's goings including saving his people. God's going includes, I should say, saving his people. And his goings also include, as we have just seen, destroying his enemies who will not repent. And, you know, those two things go together. Part, part of God saving his people includes destroying their enemies and putting them somewhere where they can no longer cause trouble. People say, don't talk about the judgment of God. Don't talk about the wrath of God. Just talk about the love of God. God's judgment and his wrath is His part of his love. How is it loving to tell an unsaved person who is hell bound? How is it loving to ignore that warning? And so they go merrily on their way to hell without ever being warned because you don't have the courage to say something to them because you know that most of them won't like you if you, if, uh, if you, if you say something to them. But that's not loving. That's selfish. That's uncaring. It's not loving. And it's also not loving to not punish those people by removing them and sending them to hell. It would be unloving toward God's holy people if throughout all eternity the wicked who refused to repent lived on the new earth with them. How would that be loving toward God's people? Then, then, then the new earth would be like this one. It would be a mess. There'd be mass shootings. There'd be stealing. There'd be murder. There'd be trouble. You'd have to lock your doors on the new earth. If God did not punish the wicked, that's not loving. I've said it before. There are certain people that they only understand one thing, and that's force. And that's just the way it is. Verse 25. The singers went before. The players on instruments followed after. Among these were the damsels playing with timbrels. And, uh, and that was the divine order for worship back in those days. God wishes to be worshipped in an orderly fashion. That is the kind of worship that is led by the Holy Spirit. God does not favor anarchy in society or in worship. I'm not saying there shouldn't be spontaneous worship. That's fine. That's, that's fine. But within the parameters of orderliness, not chaos. Verse 26. Because God is a God of order. He created the cosmos, not the chaos. Cosmos means order. Chaos means disorder. His creation reflects his orderliness. Verse 32. No, I'm sorry. Not verse 32. Verse 26. Bless ye God in the congregation, even the Lord from the fountain of Israel. There is little Benjamin with their ruler, the princes of Judah and their council, the princes of Zebulun and the princes of Naphtali. Since God refreshes us by his grace, we ought to praise him with our praise. 
One should follow the other. Notice verse 28. Thy God hath commanded thy strength. Strengthen, O God, that which thou hast wrought for us. God had issued a decree that Israel should be strong. And they were made strong. And he followed through on that decree when they were obedient. He issued a decree that Israel, his Old Testament people, should be made strong, and they were made strong. And prayer is important when it comes to strength. Because through prayer, God makes us strong. Through prayer and obedience, God moves in our lives to make us strong. And when we are strong, our joy is full. And when we are strong, we are useful to Him. It comes from obedience and prayer and faith, which is the foundation of obedience and prayer. Because if you don't have faith that God is, and He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him, then you won't pray and you won't obey. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So the more you're in the Word, the stronger your faith is going to be. The more you'll want to be in the Word, the more obedient you'll be. And it just keeps building on itself to a wonderful end, a joyous end. Verse 29. Because of thy temple at Jerusalem shall kings bring presents unto thee. And this prophecy given by David right here, came to pass when David's son Solomon was king. The temple of God was so magnificent in those days. Sol Solomon's temple, it was so magnificent that it drew important leaders from faraway lands just to come and see Solomon and the magnificence of his kingdom and his temple and even just his throne and you know what they did? They came and they gave reverence to the God of Israel because they walked away thinking, surely there is a God in this place. Surely the one true God is in this place. And today, you say, that's nice. What does it have to do with me? I'm a Christian. Well, it has everything to do with you. Same principle carries over. Today, it is the holy life of God's people that will inspire those who hunger for truth to confess there is a God and that person knows them and their life reflects them. They may not know a whole lot about God, but they'll recognize holiness and they'll recognize goodness and that will generate a respect for God in their life. Verse 30. Rebuke the company of spearmen the multitude of the bulls and the calves of the people, till everyone submit himself with pieces of silver. Scatter thou the people that delight in war. God's people do not delight in war. God's people will fight to stop an enemy who attacks or plans to attack. There's no virtue in not fighting against an evil enemy who is attacking you or your country or some innocent party. There's no virtue in letting that go on. But even when war is necessary, evil should never be perpetrated in order to expand territory or expand influence. In defense, yes. To stop an evil person or an evil nation? Yes, that is commendable. God sanctioned those sorts of things in the Old Testament. But never fight to satisfy your greed. And a nation should never do that either. Verse 31. Princes shall come out of Egypt, Ethiopia, shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. The old enemy, Egypt, 
Well, that goes back a long way, as you know, to the book of Exodus. The old enemy, Egypt, will become a friend of Israel at some point in the future. You know, and that sort of thing happens today, too. Terrible sinners suddenly become good men and good women and trustworthy friends after they come to Christ because Jesus is now on the throne of their life. And when Jesus is on the throne of your life, you're going to get along with others who are in that situation. And when Jesus rules and reigns from Israel, there will, or from, uh, yeah, from Israel, when he returns, there's going to be nations on the new earth and every nation will be submitted to Jesus, the king of the world. And that's why there will be peace. That's why the Bible says they will beat their swords into plowshares and the nations will make war no more. Why? Because they're all focused on Jesus and obeying him. That's why. Verse 32. Sing unto God, ye kingdoms of the earth. O sing praises unto the Lord. Selah. It will be a happy world once everyone everywhere is singing praises to God. Nations, nations, people simply cannot stay angry at each other if they focus on God to the point where they are giving him praise. There is no way in the world that you can praise God, be that focused on Jesus, be that filled with the Holy Spirit, and be angry at the person next to you. It's not going to happen. So, the key to getting along with your husband or your wife is for both of you to be filled with the Holy Spirit and have a Jesus focus. And I know that's not complicated. And, and I know I can't charge you 150 bucks an hour to tell you that, but I can tell you it for free, and I can tell you that it'll work because it's Bible. People won't have any trouble getting along with each other if they both praise Jesus, if they're both in love with Jesus, and they both seek to serve him and have their focus on him completely. They're not going to have any trouble getting along with each other because they're not going to do each other any harm. And they're going to be kind to one another and they're going to overlook one another's faults because we all have faults. Why? Because you're so close to Jesus and you know that he, one of the things you know from being close to him is that he has overlooked a whole lot of your faults as well. Verse 33. To him that rideth upon the heavens of heavens, which were of old, lo, he doth sent out his voice, and that a mighty voice. So God's voice. You know what God's voice is? Today, God's voice is his word, his written word. That's the word of God that I'm interested in. I'm not interested in what you think God's word to you is. I'm not interested in your vision. I'm not interested in your so-called word from God. I'm not interested in that. I'm not. I'm interested in the 31,000 plus verses in the King James Bible. I'm interested in the 66 books that make up our Bible. I'm interested in the word of God that I know is the word of God because I know that it is sufficient. I know that it is God's revelation to us, his completed revelation to us. I know that if somebody has a so-called word for God from God and it contradicts the word of God, it is not from God. It is from the flesh or it's from the devil and it needs to be disregarded. If it, if it falls in line with the word of God, it's not needed because obviously it's already in the word of God, the principle, the teaching or something. And so God's voice today is his written word. That's the only objective truth that we know for sure is objective truth. That is the only objective, pure word of God that we are 100% sure beyond all doubt is the word of God. It is the verses that make up the 66 books of the Bible. And God's word, God's voice, it is mighty. It causes revivals. God's voice, 
God's Word penetrates. God's Word does things. God's voice does things. God's Word, God's voice performs. It does not come back to Him empty. Consider how it makes dead sinners, sinners who are dead in their trespasses and sin, separated from God, hell-bound, the voice of God, the Word of God, the written Word of God makes dead sinners come alive spiritually and saves their soul from hell. Talk about power. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that is the power of God unto salvation. That's what the Bible says. It's not entertainment. It's not trying to be cute. It's not building a so-called bridge to the unsaved. Foolishness. Absolute foolishness. There's only one bridge revealed by God to the unsaved. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ, period. Anything else is just a distraction. Anything else is just busy work making Christians think that they're doing something important when they're not. Getting out the Word of God. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. The Word of God is powerful. The voice of God has power. It will give eternal life to those who are spiritually dead if it is proclaimed clearly. It will give the physically dead, life again. Jesus will speak and everyone who is in their graves will return to life, some to the resurrection of the damned, some to the resurrection of life, but it is God's voice, God's voice, and God's voice is powerful. And you know what else God's voice is? God's voice is also attractive. To Christians, it is very attractive. It is an alluring voice in a good way. It draws, it draws Christians closer to Jesus. It increases their joy. It increases their faith. It gives them a hunger for more. And it is even, it is even an alluring, in a good way, voice to those who are hungry for truth, but as of yet are hell-bound because it will draw them to Jesus for salvation. But we have to communicate the Word of God, the written Word of God. That's where our focus needs to be. Don't get off into all these other things. Our focus needs to be on proclaiming the written Word of God because that is what is anointed for sure. That is what is anointed. That is what has power. That is what has drawing power, sanctifying power. It is the written Word of God. That's why I've been teaching it verse by verse, the whole counsel of God for over 30 years because it's the only thing with power and it's the only thing that Jesus has ever said that he exalts even above his own name. And you wonder why I talk about it. God help us to proclaim his word, to put it front and center in our lives. And if your church doesn't have the written word of God front and center. If it, if it gets involved in all these other things, but the word of God isn't proclaimed clearly, and I'm not talking about cute little stories. I'm talking about the whole counsel of God. If your church doesn't proclaim the pure word of God, just a bunch of silly, stupid nonsense, why are you there and why are you supporting them? That's my question to you. Because you will answer to God for promoting that which is not right when you have an opportunity to promote that which is right, the written word of Almighty God. His voice is powerful. His voice penetrates. His voice performs. His voice allures in a good way. Notice verse 34. Ascribe ye strength unto God. His excellency is over Israel, and his strength is in the clouds. Power belongs to God. He is the power source. He is the power plant. Power belongs to God. Never doubt God's ability to do that which is impossible. Never say it's too late. Never say the odds are too stacked against me. That's not faith. God can do anything. I'm not, I'm not saying you can name it and claim it. I'm not saying that at all. That's an unbiblical heresy. promoted by charlatans who want to get rich off your back. But at the same time, 
There's a speck of truth even in heresy, and that's what makes it effective. And the fact of the matter is never doubt God's ability to do the impossible. Possible, impossible, they're all the same to God. None of it is a big deal. When it is his will to do something, none of it is a big deal. It's not a problem for him. Verse 35. O God, thou art terrifying out of thy holy places. The God of Israel is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. Blessed be God. God is terrifying. That's what the Bible says. When a person kneels before God and thinks about him, there will be a sense of awe. Yes, even in the lives of Christians, there will be a sense of awe, a deep sense of respect, and a fear. That's right. Because the closer you are to God, people say, well, God told me this, and they're so flippant. God told me this, God told me that, God spoke to me, and, and they're so flippant about it. I got my doubts. Because when you're in the presence of God, and you hear His voice, there's a deep awe, a deep respect, not a flippant attitude. And there is a fear that goes right along with it because God is God and you better believe it. And God is terrifying, especially to the unsaved. That's what brings them to Christ. You know, you can't coddle lost sinners who are hell bound. You can't coddle them. By just telling them about the love of God, the love of God, the love of God. Yeah, tell them about the love of God, but tell them what the love of God compelled God to do. To come to earth as a man, to live a sinless life, to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and pray, not my will, but your will be done, Father. And then to go to the cross and be brutalized and tortured to pay for your sins so that you wouldn't have to go to hell. Jesus didn't die on the cross, a brutal torture is death, to give you a new car, to give you a new house, to heal your body. Not in this world, necessarily. I'm not saying he doesn't do it. I'm just saying that's not why he went to the cross. He went to the cross to keep you out of hell. And people need to be taught that they are hell bound. They need to be brought to the place where they know that hell is fire, hell is torture, Hell is hopeless. Hell is flames. Hell never ends. And hell is horrible. People need to know the truth about hell. That's why Jesus talked about it so much. So what? So that they can become terrified. Yes. Not by using scare tactics. No. The Word of God is plenty scary if you're an unsaved person. But they need to be taught. Because as the Bible says right here, God is terrifying. And he needs to be terrifying to lost sinners. They should be terrified because hell is where they're bound for if they don't repent. And when they're terrified by the word of God, which is what God wants, then they can hear the good news that Jesus died on the cross to pay for their sins and remove all that terror and remove all that guilt and give them complete forgiveness. That is the gospel message. They have to be taught that they're sinners, that they're in trouble with God. That has to be proclaimed. And then you give them the good news that Jesus is the answer. And he will forgive them and show them mercy. I'm completely out of time here. Study the Word of God at thebibleversebyverse.com at your pace, at your convenience. And when you're there, please remember that this ministry is a faith ministry for over 30 years. That's the way it's been, which means I give out the Word of God, not underwritten by a large church or denomination, never have been. I depend on the prayers and the financial support of God's holy remnant who love His Word. So if you want to be a part of this ministry, and I truly mean be a part of this ministry and stand shoulder to shoulder with me and help me get out the Word of God, then pray for this ministry. Pray, 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 pray. And also click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully Ask God what he would have you contribute to help me get out the word of God. Until next time, so long.